gentlemen. Today we're going to cover uh, part two, probably of three, of the gas lecture. We're going to start with the manometer. The manometer is a modification of the barometer and it's called the U-tube manometer most often. This provides a simple device for measuring the pressure of any gas in a container. The U-tube is partially filled with mercury or water and one end is connected to the container while the other end can be opened to the atmosphere. The pressure inside the container is found from the difference in height between the mercury and the two sides of the U-tube. And this illustration shows you how um, the manometer works. Manometers are ordinarily seen in the laboratory in two flavors, the closed tube and open tube. The closed tube is shown on the left and the open tube is on the right. For practical applications in engineering and industry, especially where higher pressures must be monitored, many types of mechanical and electrical pressure gauges are also available. Okay, another key characteristic of gases is the temperature of gases. If two bodies are at different temperatures, heat will flow from the warmer to the cooler until their temperatures are the same. This principle on which thermometry is based, the temperature of an object is measured indirectly by placing a calibrated device known as the thermometer in contact with it. When the thermal equilibrium is obtained, the temperature of the thermometer is the same as the temperature of the object. A thermometer makes use of some temperature dependent quantity, such as the density of a liquid, to allow the temperature to be found indirectly through some easily measured quantity, such as the length of a mercury column. The resulting scale of temperature is entirely arbitrary and it is defined by locating the zero point in the size of the degree unit. At one point in the 18th century, 35 different temperature scales were in use. The Celsius temperature scale locates the zero point at the freezing temperature of water. The Celsius degree is defined as 1 one hundredth the difference between the freezing and boiling temperatures of water at one atmosphere of pressure or at sea level. The older Fahrenheit scale placed the zero point at the coldest temperature it was possible to obtain at the time, which was made by mixing salt and ice. The 100 degree point was set with body temperature, which was later found to be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And on this scale, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and boils at 212. The Fahrenheit scale is a finer one than the Celsius scale. There are 180 Fahrenheit degrees in the same temperature interval that contains 100 Celsius degrees. So one Fahrenheit degree equals five ninths of a Celsius degree. Since the two zero points are also different by 32 degrees Fahrenheit, conversion between the temperatures expressed in the two scales requires the addition or subtraction of this offset, as well as the multiplication by the ratio of the degree size you should be able to derive the formula for this conversion. In 1787, the French mathematician and physicist Jacques Charles discovered that for each Celsius degree that the temperature of a gas is lowered, the volume of the gas will diminish by 1 273rd of its volume at 0 degrees Celsius. The obvious implication of this is that if the temperature could be reduced to negative 273 degrees Celsius, the volume of the gas would contract to zero. Of course, all real gases condense to liquids before this happens, but at sufficiently low pressures, their volumes are linear functions of the temperature, which is called Charles's Law. The extrapolation of a plot of volume as a function of temperature predicts zero volume at negative 273 degrees Celsius. This temperature is also known as absolute zero and it co corresponds to the total absence of thermal energy. The temperature scale in which the zero point is negative 273.15 degrees Celsius was suggested by Lord Kelvin and is usually known as the Kelvin scale. Since the size of the Kelvin and Celsius degrees are the same, conversion between the two scales is as simple as a matter of adding or subtracting 273.15. However, in chemistry you can just do the whole number. So room temperature 20 degrees Celsius is about 293 degrees Kelvin. Because the Kelvin scale is based on an absolute rather than an arbitrary zero of temperature, it plays a special significance in scientific calculations. Most fundamental physical relations involving temperature are expressed mathematically in terms of absolute temperature. 
In engineering work, an absolute, absolute scale is based on the Fahrenheit degree, is sometimes used, and this is known as the Rankine scale, but you won't be using it. The volume occupied by a gas is simply the space in which the molecules of the gas are free to move. If we have a mixture of gases, such as air, the various gases will coexist within the same volume. In other words, the container doesn't matter, even if it's a mixture. If these re in these respects, gases are very different from liquids and solids, the two condensed states of matter. The volume of a gas can be measured by trapping it above mercury in a calibrated tube known as a gas burette. The SI unit of volume is the cubic meter, but in chemistry, we more commonly use the liter or milliliter. The cubic centimeter is also frequently used, and it is very close to one milli milliliter. You can almost use them interchangeably. It is important to bear in mind, however, that the volume of a gas varies with both the temperature and the pressure, so reporting the volume alone is not very useful. A common practice is to measure the volume of a gas under the ambient temperature and atmospheric pressure, and then to correct the observed volume to what it would be at standard atmospheric pressure and some fixed temperature, usually at zero degrees or 25 degrees Celsius. So the pneumatic era of chemistry began with the discovery of the vacuum around 1650, which clearly established that gases are a form of matter. The ease with which gases could be studied soon led to the discovery of numerous empirical, which means experimentally discovered, laws that proved fundamental to the later development of chemistry and led indirectly to the atomic view of matter. These laws are so fundamental to all the natural sciences and engineering that everyone learning these subjects needs to be familiar with them. So let's take a look at the first one, which is Boyle's Law. Robert Boyle, who lived from 1627 to 1691, showed that the volume of air trapped by a liquid in the closed short limb of a J-shaped tube, or in other words, another type of manometer, decreased in exact proportion to the pressure produced by the liquid in the long part of the tube. The trapped air acted much like a spring, exerting a force opposing its compression. Boyle called this effect the spring of the air and published his results in a pamphlet of that title. The difference between the heights of the two mercury columns gives a pressure um, of 76 centimeters, which equals one atmosphere. And the volume of the air is calculated from the length of the air column and the tubing diameter. So Boyle's law can be expressed as pressure times volume equals a constant, or equivalently, the pressure times the volume of the first object equals the pressure and volume of the second. These relations hold true only if the number of molecules, n, and the temperature are constant. This is a relation of inverse proportionality. So that means that any change in the pressure is exactly compensated by an opposing change in the volume. So as the pressure decreases towards zero, the volume will increase without limit. Conversely, as the pressure is increased, the volume decreases but can never reach zero. There will be a separate um, pressure and volume plot for each temperature, and a single pressure times volume plot is therefore called an anisotherm. It is very important that you understand that this plot governs any relationship of inverse proportionality. You should be able to sketch out such a plot when given a value of any, any one x-y pair. A related type of plot with which you should be familiar shows that the product pressure times volume as a function of the pressure. You should understand why this yields a straight line and how this set of plots relates to one immediately above. So let's take a look at a practice problem. In an industrial process, a gas confined to a volume of 1 liter at a pressure of 20 atmospheres is allowed to flow into a 12 liter container by operating the valve that connects the two containers. What will be the final pressure of the gas? Well, we take the final volume of the gas is 1 plus 12 liters, so 13 liters. The gas expands in inverse proportion to the two volumes. So, V1 times P1 equals V2 times P2. So that means to find P2, the second pressure, you divide 
V1, P1 divided by V2. So that gives you 20 atmospheres times 1 liter divided by 13 liters. So your answer is 1.5 atmospheres. Please note that there is no need to make explicit use of any formula in problems of this kind. Okay, we're going to pick this up in part 3, so I will see you then.